All right. Um, thank you for joining us for the Chagas Echo Series brought to you by um, San Diego State University, UT El San Antonio Echo, Texas State University, and the South Coastal Area Health Education Center, um, also known as AHEC. Um, I'm Kato, and I just have a couple of housekeeping announcements before I pass things over to Dr. Stigolet and others. Um, these sessions are enabled for live closed captioning. Um, if you would like to view closed captioning for this session, please navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and select the show captions option. Um, you may need to click on the three dots um, or more menu at the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen to find this option. Um, for those who've done this already, um, thank you so much. Um, to help us with attendance, please enter your name, affiliation, and email into the chat. And to access the chat feature, click on the speech bubble icon on navigation bar at the bottom of your window. Um, and also, if you want to view any of this content later, please know that the, uh, we are recording these sessions for later distribution through the Chagas Echo website. Uh, we encourage everybody to join by video for the discussion portion of the session. Um, that being said, regardless of how you've shown up today, we're just happy you're here to learn alongside us. Um, please stay muted unless you're speaking, and we do encourage you to speak. Um, if you've joined by computer, your mute button is on the bottom left of your Zoom controls, um, or if you've joined on the phone, um, just press star six to unmute. Um, you can also use the reactions menu in the bottom right of your Zoom screen to raise your hand and indicate you have a comment to share. Um, or you can use the chat to ask questions, answer questions, and share any perspectives that you may have. Um, and finally, please note that no protected health information is allowed in either the chat um, or our discussions. And towards the end of the session, we will send out a link to a quick evaluation survey. Um, please fill it out for a few reasons. Um, first, um, it gives us your feedback on how to refine and shape these sessions to address your priorities and needs. And filling out this survey also um, qualifies you for receiving free CME or DVM credits. Um, today's session will start with a presentation, um, Chagas Disease and Veterinary Medicine, Tracking a Neglected Disease. Following that, we'll discuss a case relevant to this topic area. Um, there are a lot of professions represented here today, um, a lot of experiences and perspectives. I encourage each of you to share that during our discussion so that we can learn from each other in this space. Um, for those who may be new to ECHO, it stands for Extension for Community Health Care Outcomes. This is a model of lifelong learning and guided practice that connects community-based health workers with each other and team of subject matter experts to create a community of practice and learning. Our aim in this series is to build knowledge, skills, and understanding among the health workforce about Chaga cities. How we support each other's growth through these regular sessions that include didactics, um, cases, and group to share resources, challenges, and strategies for ch Chaga screening and care. Um, and I would like to hand um, the mic over to Dr. Paul, Paul um, Stigler. <laughs> All right, thank you, Kato. I'm super excited to have all of you here today. Um, these are our regular ECHO sessions. I know there's a lot of new people here today. So um, thanks for joining us. I'm very excited about our topic. Uh, we do a one health approach to Chagas disease. So we talk about human health, we talk about animal health, we talk about environmental health. And today happens to be our veterinary focus. And um, this is something that we, we definitely do a couple of times a, a year. So I'm really excited that we have two wonderful guest um, speakers today. And um, we're gonna get started here. If you could get me to the next slide, please. By the way, um, I am Paula Stigler-Granados. I am an associate professor at San Diego State University and also an adjunct faculty at Texas State University. We have been leading the Texas Chagas Task Force um, on Chagas disease, which I'm now sort of converting over to the U.S. Chagas Task Force since I'm in two parts of the country at the same time um, a lot. And um, so we're just I've been doing Chagas disease for about eight, ten, nine, ten years now and uh, very passionate about the topic. So I'm glad you all are here and hopefully you're just as passionate as we are. So this is just a quick disclosure of any relevant financial relationships. Um, we do not have any, um, and if there are any by any of the individual presenters, they will disclose that. Next slide, please. 
So this is our um, how we're going today with our session. I would really encourage you all um, to put the comments and questions in the chat. If you have a dying question, you just cannot wait to um, ask, you know, please raise your hand and, and when it's appropriate, we'll um, ask the speakers to stop for a moment and answer the questions. We have a lot of material to cover and a very little bit of time. And so if any of the questions don't get answered in the chat, we are going to be able to stay over a little bit longer for those that want to talk more. And I have a feeling there's going to be lots and lots of questions. So um, please feel free to put those in there. We have several of us that are trying to monitor the chat. I'll try to facilitate any uh, important questions as we go along. So this is how we're going to do a didactic uh, presentation. And then we are going to switch over to um, talking about different cases. And when we get to the cases, this is where we do really like a lot of interaction. And um, we might ask some questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and shout it out or put it in the chat, whichever you feel more comfortable doing. All right, next slide. All right, so with that, um, I wanted to also quickly introduce my team. I have Dr. Dr. Zhu, who is with us from Texas State. She's a really close colleague of mine, been doing this for a while. I've got Michael Vangelo, who's my research associate here working with us. Um, we've got Cato with us as well from UT Health. And there's a whole other team of people that aren't with us today, but that help us support these echoes. And I also wanna thank the CDC for supporting us through our cooperative agreement to support our echo sessions as well. So um, with that, I'm gonna let Dr. Zhu uh, introduce Dr. Madigan, and then I'm gonna introduce Dr. McBride, and then we'll start the session. I think Dr. Z, you gotta unmute. We always do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Uh, Madigan, who is a 2001 a graduate of the Texas A&M University at the College of Veterinary Medicine. He's been serving as director of the Animal Hospital of Simpson, Smithson Valley in the Spring Branch, Bolverde community for over 15 years now. And he focuses on small animal companion animals. It was there that he fostered the passion for treating Chagas disease and made it his mission to increase awareness of it to the public. Uh, currently, Dr. Madigan is working at, at the international level on a canine and human treatment for the disease. And he founded a nonprofit pharmaceutical company, which is uh, devoted to serving the impoverished communities through the development of treatments for neglected diseases. So uh, Dr. Madigan, the floor is yours. Actually, really quickly, I'm just going to introduce Shannon as well so that we don't oh, have sorry. any, it's okay, so we don't have any gaps in the presentation. We can just move right into it. Okay. Um, and so and just another little fact about Roy, he's been part of our task force work since the beginning. He's been doing Chagas a lot longer than I have, and he's one of our very um, amazing champions for this disease. So I'm super happy he's here today. Um, and I'm also excited about Dr. McBride. I have had the pleasure of getting to, to know her through our graduate program. She was a master's student wrapping up her master's degree, launching into our doctorate program in global health. And I am so lucky um, to work side by side with her. She's a veterinarian, the passion for zoonotic and vector-borne diseases. I know that by seeing first time she ever presented to me on vector borne diseases in my class. And I'm like, I really, really want you to work on Chagas with me. She graduated from Washington State University College of Veterinary Medicine in 2015. And that's where she has her interest in public and global health. After graduating vet school, she gained some practice experience in equine sports medicine and small animal relief work. And as I said, she's uh, currently in the throes of her master's thesis and launched already into our doctoral program. Um, she has a broad interest in zoonotic and vector-borne diseases, particularly interested now in Chagas disease. I think she's going to be our next champion out here in California and committed to using her research and expertise to improve prevention, surveillance, diagnostics, and treatment of zoonotic and vector-borne diseases. She is also a practicing veterinarian, currently doing relief work here in San Diego, which we need a lot of here. Um, and I'm grateful that she's here to help present these cases with Dr. Madigan. And now with that, that was a lot. We'd like to turn it over to um, Dr. Madigan. And also just as a reminder, please put where you're from um, and your contact information 
in the chat. And at the end, there will be an evaluation to fill out, especially if you'd like to get the um, continuing education credits, which this is our first time we've been able to offer DVM credits as well. So we're really excited about that. So thank you. And floor is yours now officially. Hey, thank you, Paula. Appreciate it. Um, let me share my screen for you guys. Thanks for having me today. I'm uh, very excited to share with you something very close to me uh, with Chagas disease. Um, we're going to go through this material fairly quickly, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on you know, what Chagas is. Most people know a little bit about it, transmission, and things like that. But I really want to focus on the prevalence of Chagas disease in Texas, especially in the United States, for what data we do have, um, what Chagas disease looks like in our patients, and also, more importantly, how do we diagnose it, treat it, and who do we treat? Okay, so buckle up. We're going to get going here, and then um, Dr. McBride's going to spend some time doing some case studies to kind of all tie it in for everybody. Okay. All right, so as everybody knows, Chagas disease is a protozoal parasite, Trypanosoma cruzi, and it's spread like other vector-borne diseases by a vector, and that vector happens to be kissing bug. Okay, the classic transmission for Chagas disease in any mammal is that the kissing bug takes a blood meal, and at the same time, it defecates or shortly thereafter. And inside of the feces, the parasites reside, and they make their way into the bite wound, get into the bloodstream, go through the lymphatics, and then are disseminated throughout the entire body. So you can see here on this picture of this recumbent dog, um, hopefully it's sleeping and it's not dead, but these parasites go to the heart um, as well as other tissues. We just pick on the heart because Chagas has an affinity for that. But once it's there, it goes into a distinct phase called the amastigote phase. It's just this intracellular stage. It's very similar to a virus where it replicates slowly. And then eventually when it gets to a critical mass, it converts into these trypomastigotes, which are the babies or the microfilaria. We want to kind of talk about heartworm disease. It ruptures the cell and in doing so, it kills that cell, goes into circulation and continues that life cycle into the bloodstream where it's picked up by another kissing bug as it's taking a blood meal. Now, this is the classic transmission. In dogs, we actually feel that the, the more common transmission route is just oral ingestion of the bugs. And if anybody has a dog, I mean, you know they eat everything, including cat turds, but they eat, definitely eat some bugs out there, and our dogs are, are definitely guilty of that. So oral transmission is a really, really big way that these guys can catch Chagas disease. They can also get vertical transmission, so from the bitch to the babies. They can also get through blood transfusions and also from carrying ingestion, so eating stuff they're not supposed to. So those are kind of some common ways there. So what do kissing bugs feed on? Um, kissing bugs eat anything that breathes, pretty much. And you can see from this pie graph out of Louisiana, you can see the different breakdown of the blood meals that these bugs found whenever some grad student had to dissect them out. But it really is helpful information. Um, apparently, frogs uh, taste delicious to these guys and humans. Um, you can see dogs on there, but but anything that breathes that that, that breathes out CO2, these bugs are going to be attracted to and take a blood meal. Okay, we have seven different species of kissing bugs. So if your client comes to you and says, "Hey, is this a kissing bug?" Um, you know, there's some common ones that we have here, but you might have to you know get out your book if you're going to help them out a little bit. But we do have three pretty common ones that we see around here. Um, they are more active in the summer months, but if you're like me, I mean, we're in San Antonio. It's like we have one season; it's just hot, so they're active year round. Um, and whenever we look at these kissing bugs and we say, you know, how many of these bugs actually do carry the parasite? We find that over 60% of them carry it. So. Put, to put that into context internationally, we're right on board with like Mexico City. OK, so we're no different from, you know, these other countries that we consider, you know, different from us. We definitely have Chagas disease in our vectors here. OK, um, reservoirs, like we were saying in this pie graph, you know, what keeps Chagas disease alive in the world are these animal reservoirs. So, you know, possum, raccoon, rats, those kind of things. But here in Texas, you know, our, our state animal, um, the armadillo, you know, they're, they're loaded with Chagas disease. So anything, again, that breathes, you're going to potentially find Chagas disease there. So where is, and this is kind of an important slide for you guys, because it's one of our bullet points, you know, what is the prevalence of Chagas disease in Texas or in the United States for that matter? So this map you'll see pretty commonly referred to um, in the literature. It's made by the CDC. They did a great job of kind of portraying where these kissing bugs are in the United States. You can see just south of Oregon, all the way over and just south of New York, you just draw a line and that line of latitude, anything south of there, we've got kissing bugs, okay? Where you find kissing bugs, you find Chagas disease. 
And so like Paul and Shannon are working on right now, they're working on prevalence of Chagas disease in California. We don't have very much data. You can kind of see here at the bottom of the slide, you know, there's one study on prevalence data in dogs from a long time ago um, where we have some data. But on this slide, I tried to frame Chagas disease prevalence in the context of heartworm disease. We're all super familiar with heartworm disease and that's what's in red. Um, so we're just comparing that for now, okay? And we'll compare it to some other infectious diseases a little bit later on. But Louisiana, number one in the country for heartworm disease, 7.1%. When we look, dive a little bit deeper, look at how much Chagas do they have, we're actually at 22%. So pretty high numbers. And you can kind of just walk through the states that we have on there. Texas has a little bit more data. Um, we, we just, we just look more. Okay. We're, uh, we're pretty passionate about this. We see patients that die from it. We invest money in it. We look into these things. Okay. But you can see, we break it down into different kind of groups of dogs, you know, companion animals, of course, which we all deal with, um, working dogs. If you're a military veterinarian, thank you for your service, but thank you also for working with these dogs, which are incredible, but they also have kind of a different prevalence rate here at 8% in Texas. And then we have you know, companion dogs and that, that number fluctuates 13.6%. Um, that's what it is currently today. That is obviously going to go up or down over time, but you can kind of get the general gist of things. You know, we, we see a lot of Chagas disease in these states, okay, and considerably more than heartworm disease. So if I don't live in a state that's yellow, do I need to worry about Chagas disease? Well, unfortunately, uh, you do because of travel. OK, and I pulled this article. This is from 2018. And um, they looked at Border Patrol dogs. OK, and you know, all the way up to the northern border of Canada, the United States, you know, obviously in the southern border where we are with Mexico. You know, these dogs, um, they bring their diseases with them whenever they come out of training. Uh, most of these dogs are trained here in uh, San Antonio, Central Texas, where we have Chagas. So they're exposed. They come over from Germany or Europe uh, where they're bred. They get trained up here, they get exposed to things like Chagas, and then they disperse throughout the world. And so just because you're a Canadian veterinarian doesn't mean you aren't going to be exposed to Chagas disease. And, and we get calls from, you know, around the world, unfortunately, from, for Chagas disease you know, quite frequently, and um, they definitely see it up there. So be on the lookout, okay, because um, it needs to be on your list of differentials, even if you're in Alaska. All right, so again, we're framing Chagas disease right now. So let's talk a little bit more about other diseases that we screen for, other infectious diseases. So just a simple little snap test in shelter dogs, they looked at the usual suspects, you know, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Lyme, and you can kind of see the percentages in Texas that they got here, you know, 0.2% Lyme, right? Because we don't have very much of it in Texas. Heartworm, 16%, and then of course, Chagas disease, 18%. Um, we worked with the FDA on some of these things, and um, they were able to kind of give us some numbers, what that actually would look like based on that population. And just from this data out of Texas A&M, unfortunately, you're, you're looking at almost 400,000 shelter dogs with Chagas disease in Texas alone. Which is, that's, that's quite a few. Um, also, another quick point, um, just as a, as a diagnostician, you know, as a clinician, if you have a dog with heartworm disease, it doesn't mean that they can only have heartworm disease, right? They can also have Chagas disease. And in this paper, it was kind of interesting, uh, one out of five dogs with heartworm also had Chagas disease. So a little dummy, double whammy for the heart there. And the last slide about prevalence, um, people ask this all the time, you know, well, is my dog at risk? You know, I have a German Shepherd, I have a Rottweiler. They actually, the English and French Bulldog, thank you, TikTok and Instagram, are now the number one dog, at least in Texas, for Chagas disease at 54%. And then, of course, we have the German Shepherd. And then don't ask me about the Chihuahua. I guess a lot of uh, a lot of people went over to a cardiology service from our area <laughs> because the Chihuahua is definitely overrepresented here. Um, but the take home for these guys is, I mean, these these three breeds could not be any different from each other, any more different. And so, you know, don't don't let breed um dissuade you okay from from testing or following up on Chagas disease if you think it needs to be on your list of differentials okay um overall prevalence in companion animals 16.8 percent based on a referral hospital Texas A&M um and it, again it was very similar to our 18 percent that they found in shelter dogs um kind of interesting fact you know why were these dogs tested were they turning purple and fainting uh, were they lethargic um, most of them were referred because they had an arrhythmia um, or they had a pack mate that was infected. And in my personal experience, um, 
I'd probably say half the cases that we diagnose are, are because their pack mate tested positive for whatever reason. So we're, we're kind of exploring those, uh, you know, exposure and things like that. Interesting fact, um, they found out of this paper that if you have a dog in your pack that's infected, all the other pack mates are 13 times more likely to be infected with Chagas disease. That's a risk factor, okay? So if you do diagnose a dog with Chagas disease, make sure you test other dogs in the pack. And I'd even extend that to why don't you test all companion animals, uh, including cats, okay? But we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, so pathogenesis, uh, what's going on? in the tissues, okay? What is Chagas disease doing? Why is it so bad? Chagas does three different things in tissues in general. We're gonna focus again on the heart because it likes it, we got a lot of data on that, but really it goes to any tissue, okay? It's gonna cause inflammation, myocarditis, that's the biggie, okay? Any amount of myocarditis is not good, okay? So that inflammation causes a lot of problems, okay? The second thing it does is it disrupts the autonomic nervous system. So if you think about the pacemaker in the heart, the right atrium, as a giant power strip, probably looks like my power strip behind my TV where my wife's plugged in everything, about to short circuit something. You have all these parasympathetic and sympathetic plugins um, for you know heart rate rate, basically. And at that area, because of the affinity that T. Cruza has for these parasympathetic ganglia. Um, there's a lot of action going on in there, okay? Consequently, it disrupts the autonomic nervous system. So you'll see parasympathetic denervation. You'll see sympathetic denervation. You'll see all these different types of Brady and tachyarrhythmias because of that. So it does definitely destroy that. On the human side, in some degree to dogs, it will also attack neurological areas like the colon, for instance, or the esophagus, and you'll get disease in those areas because of this affinity for those ganglia, okay? The third thing that it does is it causes vasculitis, microvascular disturbances, um, and people, stroke is a huge problem with Chagas disease. We don't see that too, too commonly, although the last case that we have um, that Shana's gonna talk about um, actually talks about uh, stroke in a dog because of Chagas disease. So it is a possibility. Regardless of the mechanism of action, the consequence is that we have a progressive disease. And in terms of the heart, we have a progressive fibrosis and eventually heart failure. Okay. Now that's the end result of Chagas disease in a, in a mammal, but we'll talk about dogs in a dog. We'll get a dilated cardiomyopathy. We may get mitral valve disease because of that hypertrophic in cats. But anywhere along that continuum from infection to heart failure, we can still die. And the reason is number two, arrhythmias, okay? I can't understate um, how important arrhythmias are in Chagas disease. It is, I'd say 90% of the disease that I see in dogs with Chagas, they're arrhythmias, okay? 10% is heart disease as far as dilation and function, okay? But it's important. But arrhythmias are way more important, which will probably answer the question that a lot of you have, you know, do I need to treat an asymptomatic dog that doesn't have enlargement or functional issues? And the answer is yes, because of the arrhythmias. These are real and they really do kill these dogs. OK, so that's a that's a huge, huge red flag of arrhythmias. And then, of course, over time, we do get extensive remodeling, just like you would your regular heart disease, like your dilate cardiomyopathy and mitral valve. You'll see dilation of chambers, and eventually you'll get some functional issues that, that arise because of that. All right, so what does this look like in the clinic when they come in? Chagas disease is divided into two parts, okay, or two distinct processes. We have an acute phase and a chronic phase, okay? The majority of the cases that you're going to see in practice are going to be on the chronic phase, and, and what I see, okay? 99% are in the chronic phase, okay? But the way we distinguish these, and a good way to distinguish them in your brain is, in the acute phase, I've just been exposed to a pathogen. What's my body going to do? It's going to get inflamed because of all this parasitemia. I've got parasites in the blood. I've got parasites in the tissues. I'm going to mobilize everything I have to send it over. Neutrophils, monocytes, lymphocytes, cytokines are flying everywhere. It can get a little out of hand. Okay, so you can notice some pretty serious disease. The dog comes in with a 220 heart rate and an arrhythmia. Okay, young dog uh, with a belly full of fluid. Okay, um, sudden death, neurological symptoms. There's a lot of things that this disease can cause in the acute phase. But to be honest, you know, how do we get all these chronic phases? Well, we had some pretty non nonspecific signs. OK, and they see that in humans, too. You know, um, dogs, we may have a day or two of diarrhea like or vomiting you know, like that ever happens. Right. It probably happens on a weekly basis at my house because of all the stuff that the dogs eat. 
So it, it, it's kind of an area where, you know, unless you see the dog eating a bug, you're probably not going to see the acute phase too often, okay? By far, the majority of the cases are going to be chronic, okay? Chronic, on the other hand, is defined by a very low-grade parasitemia. You've got this smoldering inflammation in the tissue, so we've got a myocarditis, but it's nice and slow and low. Okay? It's like barbecue. You're just cooking real quietly, okay? In some cases, the organism is almost dormant. It's barely replicating, okay? So it's kind of flying under the radar. Um, but during that time, what it's doing is it's popping those cells, like we saw in the first slide. It's causing fibrosis, and it's progressive with that disease. You get enough of that damage, you get enough inflammation, especially when you have a hatch out or they all of a sudden explode, maybe 10 or 20 cells, you're going to get some inflammation in there. And that's when you might catch that arrhythmia. Okay. So the arrhythmias are a good detection early on. Um, you can also get some chronic diseases that we talk about with heart disease, mitral valve disease, dilated cardiomyopathy. And I put this in here to remind me, yep, even Dobermans and boxers, you know, you want a knee jerk on that. You want to say, that's a Dobie. I know it's dilated cardiomyopathy. It's genetic. Hold on, it might be shockers, okay? So keep that on your list, okay? Also put there, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on the, the diet-related cardiomyopathies, but that's definitely one of the things you need to put on there. You know, if you're thinking lentils, think shagas too, okay? And then of course, the majority of these cases um, appear asymptomatic. And I say appear because if the owner's looking at them or I'm looking at them, we have two different opinions on what's symptomatic, right? And honestly, a lot of owners aren't very active with their dogs. And so, you know, how could you tell if your dog has exercise intolerance? You don't ever walk your dog. You know, you greet him with food and you go to bed with food. So we're not really asking too much of our companion dogs. So it's that asymptomatic. I use that term loosely. Once we hook up an EKG or a halter, we could probably find something that's wrong. So asymptomatic, meaning owners aren't going to complain anything on the mystery. OK, so histopath, what does it look like? This is the, and sorry to put a, a pathology slide in, I know everybody's cringing right now, but, but basically on the left, we've got normal heart tissue on the right, we don't. This is the acute phase. Notice all the purple on the right, purple's bad, purple's inflammation, you see a lot of it, but there's still a lot of pink in there. There's a lot of, you know, sustainable, healthy cardiac tissue. It's just inflamed right now. They're not feeling too well. Now contrast this with the chronic phase, okay? Looks a little bit different. Now I know it's zoomed out, but you can't see very much purple, just trust me on this one. And then you see a lot of white, okay? So that's that fibrosis. Technically, it's fat replacement. That's what the heart does. It doesn't really get that much scar tissue. It gets fatty replacement. But the end result is that's non-functional tissue. And everywhere there's a circle on that page, that's where tissue was, and that's where the cells were destroyed from Chagas. And this is something that's happened over years, okay? It's been a slow, progressive decline. Now, this dog, um, Dr. McBride's going to talk about, this is Turbo, and you'll see the slide again. Um, but he had about 50% destruction and he was still able to run around like the wild man, chocolate, chocolate lab. You, you know what I'm talking about. This is uh, just some clinical signs of, uh, of Chagas disease. What we see on the left is acute. That's a, obviously a heart. It's um, heavy, edematous, purplish. It's a sick, heavy heart. Okay. It's an acute phase. In the middle, we have a chronic asymptomatic dog coming in for Christmas. Just wanted to wish everybody Merry Christmas. Okay. Then we have on the right side, this is our, more you know chronic symptomatic dog although this dog's only a year old um they come in hey my dog's pregnant you know and you've got this big pot belly and that's about two or three liters of fluid on this 25 pound dog because he's in right-sided heart failure so it's like the many faces of Chagas disease okay this next picture is a little gross i'll be honest okay um this is a necropsy from great dane and that on the right and the left that's the liver Okay. Yes, that liver weighed 11 pounds. Okay. And you see all that disgusting, looks like exudate. This was all hepatomegaly, secondary to right side of heart failure. Okay. This is the heart of that dog, the big, big, big dilated heart. You can actually see white in there from the fibrosis or the fatty replacement. Um, this is what can happen. Okay. And obviously this dog didn't make it. We don't want to have that much disease. Okay. Um, the last thing that we see in dogs is um, if any of you guys do repro work, this is kind of interesting. I thought it was when we started looking into it. Um, but we talked about earlier vertical transmission from the bitch to the puppies, right? We don't know how many dogs or puppies get infected from this, um, but we do know that in humans, it's about 5%. Not much, but it's real. I mean, I've lost entire litters from Chagas. I've had litters that their moms were diagnosed positive, still had the litter, and none of them got it. Okay, so we don't know exactly in dogs, but we do know if you've got puppies that are fading, you know, failure to thrive, they're dying, they're underweight, um, you do a C-section, you're like, something isn't right here. You know, this placenta looks awful. Think about Chagas, okay? It's definitely something. And remember, bulldogs, Frenchies, 
number one in Texas, right? C-sections, that, that's something you're definitely going to see. We see a ton of these guys with Chagas disease. So something to think about on that one, okay? Um, this is probably the second most important slide. The first one's next, but uh, mortality rate. This is, again, clinical signs, death. We, we obviously don't want to see that. That's not a good symptom to have. But mortality rate in Chagas disease is high. When you look at the literature, it's anywhere from 25 to 42%, okay, over a two-year window. So they took dogs, watched them for 24 months, and found out that a quarter to a third of them died, okay, during that window. It's real, okay? And the reason is, off to the right, that's VTAC. Dogs be bopping along in a sinus rhythm, a rhythm, rhythm, and then it goes into VTAC, and then that's it, okay? This can happen at a drop of a hat. Any excitation, you know, in human medicine, they say you know, exercise-induced arrhythmias and things like that. What we're finding in dogs is you just take the treat bag and shake it, and that's like an exercise-induced arrhythmia. Their heart can go crazy. Or, hey, you know, they wake up from sleeping and they see their owner. They see us first thing in the morning. Where have you been? You know, they're so excited, and then they can drop like that if they fire an arrhythmia. So mortality rate is huge. And this, to me, when I'm, I'm talking with clients, this is what gets them to treat, okay? When you talk about this, that the mortality rates are so high, and I can't predict which group your dog's going to be in, this is what's going to get them to go ahead and move forward with further diagnostics and treatment, okay? And then at the bottom, we just talked about in humans, the comparison. So a little bit worse in dogs. As a side note, we think the mortality rate's higher in dogs because of oral transmission. All right, so this is the most important slide because I know a lot of you are probably like, okay, wow, we've got Chagas. Who am I going to test? You know, you're probably going through your files right now. Oh, yeah, that dog. Oh, well, what about that dog? The easiest place to start whenever you're trying to diagnose Chagas disease is to start with your cardiac patients. And again, I don't care what cardiac patient they are, test them, okay? Because we see a lot of dogs with other diseases, mitral valve disease, dilate cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure. These things we see on a weekly basis in a general pra practice, these guys can have Chagas disease. And there's some reasons for it. I won't go into that too much, but at Texas A&M, 28% of their dogs with dilated cardiomyopathy, when they tested them for Chagas, get what? guess what? Had Chagas, okay? 40% of the heart failure dogs over there had Chagas disease. That was kind of surprising to me because that, that's a pretty high number. But again, it's a tertiary hospital. They're doing pretty poorly. You know, that's when they're going to get referred. The other thing is any dog with right-sided heart dilation, go ahead and check for Chagas. You're going to check for heartworm disease. You're going to be worried about pulmonary hypertension, but go ahead and check for Chagas, okay? It loves the right side of the heart. Any dog with arrhythmias, you're doing a dental procedure, doing a neuter, a spay, tumor removal, whatever, or you're in the exam room and you're listening for, you know, 20 seconds and you feel a pulse deficit or you hear an arrhythmia, don't assume that it's a respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Go ahead and check that dog for Chagas, okay? That's going to be sometimes your only clue. Um, diet related, any of the ones that you've gone through, gone, you know, are you on a grain-free diet? You have a heart murmur. We need to switch your diet. Check those guys for Chagas disease, Okay. And then last, and again, we're not talking that much about cats, I apologize, but hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 50% of the cats that I see with hypertrophic have Chagas disease, okay? It's a very underdiagnosed disease causing this, but we see it a lot, okay? And cats are not exempt from that. And they do really, really, really well with treatment, okay? The other set or subset of diseases that I like to test for um, that are kind of low-hanging fruit or idiopathic disease. So any of your autoimmune diseases, including thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, those need to be tested for Chagas, okay? Any of your uveitis, you got a red eye and I have no idea why, or the ophthalmologist says, yep, he's got idiopathic uveitis. That dog needs a Chagas test. Any of those diseases you're running, you know, fungal titers on, Bartonella, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, tick-borne diseases, just add it on there, okay, because it can do that, all right? And then, of course, the last one is, you know, any lymphadenopathy or splenomegalies, okay, that needs to be worked up for uh, Chagas disease as well as neurological, okay? All right, so diagnostics. Um, these are some indirect ways to diagnose it. We kind of briefly talked about EKGs. There's a wide range of arrhythmias. Um, it's a good screener, okay? And we do a lot of these, you know? I mean, anesthesia, everybody's getting one of these. So that's a good place that you're probably going to find some of your cases, okay? Diagnostic imaging, uh, let's say you're shooting for, um, you know, I'm shooting for bladder stones. Hey, that heart looks a little big to me. I need to be thinking about that, okay? Echocardiogram, same way. Um, a new paper out of a and that compared uh, cardiac imaging with MRI and echoes and EKGs and halters. Um, they found out that a lot of these dogs, the majority of them that had echo abnormalities had right-sided dysfunction, okay? So if you are doing your own echoes or you have someone coming in to do those, you're referring them, 
you just go ahead and have them take a look at that right ventricle if you're in an endemic region, okay? Um, pathology, um, there's a slide here, there's a little picture rather of a trypomastigote. That's what it looks like. And it puts it in the context of a red blood cell so you can kind of see, you'll rarely see that, but if you have a dog in the acute phase, you might get lucky. Um, to the right are amastigotes in a macrophage. And that's from a lymph node aspirate. So you got a big lymph node, you aspirate it, you see that. Um, it's not histo, it's chagas, okay? So another way you can do that. And of course, you know, necropsy. You have a dog with sudden death, you come in and uh, you post them and you do some slides, you, you might find chagas disease. It's unfortunately a very common place that we find it, okay? Um, EKG is critical, guys, okay? I, this is the number one tool. If we only had one tool that we could use to assess a chagas patient, it would be EKG because uh, arrhythmias are so common. Um, Holter monitors are also incredibly important. Uh, we can tell a lot from a dog over 24 hours uh, versus five minutes, right? We also use EKG to follow up the treatment to make sure we resolve those arrhythmias and parentheses. Okay. Um, the gold standard for diagnosis is serology. We're looking for antibodies. Okay. Antibodies um, stick around. When they get infected with Chagas disease, antibodies specific for the parasite are made and we can detect those. Okay. We can detect those through, and at least in veterinary medicine right now, we have two methods that we can do. Okay. IFA, um, fluorescent antibody or we can do ELISA. I'm going to put the sensitivities and specificities up there. It takes a minimum of three weeks, well, probably two weeks, but let's say three weeks for sure until we make enough antibodies to detect on either one of these tests, okay? Um, the IFA um, is run out of TVMDL. Um, it used to be a fairly good test, but since 2015, it's really gone down on sensitivities. And so we've moved our testing over to ELISA since we have it available now. Much, much, much more sensitive. Um, the good thing about these diseases or about these tests for this disease is that there is very little to none false positives. OK, that's very important because anytime you get that test back, you're like, oh, shoot, what if it cross reacted with? And you're thinking we're going to go into a slide in a minute and to talk about that. But these tests are very, very good. Um, but again, ELISA is my number one uh, compared to IFA because the sensitivity is so, so low in the IFA. PCR, some of you guys asked me about that. Why don't I just do a PCR? In the acute phase, it's excellent. You're going to find it almost 100% of the time. You're going to find pieces of the parasite floating around. Uh, but in the chronic phase, as it goes dormant, the parasite load goes way down. And it's not even that it goes down. It's more that it's intermittent. Okay, it's just like microfilaria. You've got a dog with heartworm disease. You look up in the microscope. I don't see any microfilaria. What well, doesn't mean he doesn't have heartworm disease. It just means I'm not seeing those microfilaria at this time. It's the same for Chagas disease. So we use PCR are mainly either in the acute phase or we'll use it to follow up with therapy with serial PCR so we can increase that sensitivity, okay? Um, again, more on the diagnostics. ELISA, we use a place called VRL in uh, San Antonio. I'll have their slide up here in a minute. So if you guys want to contact them for the ELISA, it's about $125 to the client, not, not to us. Um, we ship it overnight, get it run. Um, excellent, excellent test. It's a lab that's been running this for about 30 years on primates, and they just we said, hey, we need an ELISA, and they said, no problem. They made one for dogs, and it's it's incredible. Uh, much better than the IFA. Um, this is also the lateral flow test that we're working on right now. Um, hopefully, that'll be available next year. It'll be paired with or without a heartworm test, so we can start screening dogs routinely. It's going to be a lot more affordable, about $35 to the client, and real rapid test. That test was actually built based on the platform for the ELISA, so it's very, very good technology with recombinant antigens, no cross-reactivity, which is nice. Uh, this is just a little slide to remind me about the discrepancies between the IFA and the ELISA. Um, on the right, it, well, the, the left slide here, it says TVMDL IFA. You can see all the negatives. Um, and then we confirm these with ELISA just to make sure. And you can see there were, were some discordant results, okay? And then on the right, I have a copy of a report that I got back a couple months ago. So the titer, it says greater than 1280. If you've never run one of these tests, it's just an amount of antibody. Basically at 1280, they're like, yeah, we're giving up. It's really, really, really high. We're just going to stop. Okay. Um, but then you can see at the highlighted area, it says, please disregard the original report that listed initial screening results as negative. Okay. This is a backstory, but the short of it is, is that this initially came out negative and the client, not me, the client called and was like, you know, kind of gave him a what, what, and they, they went ahead and re-ran the test and it actually came out beyond positive, like super positive. So I put the slide in there to say, you know, testing, it, it's a test, nothing's hundred percent, but if I have one shot at it, I'm going to pick a better test. Okay. So I do want to encourage you guys to do the ELISA. 
Um, we're going to skip this because we're running a little slow on time. This is just to remind me too, you are get, you may have test discrepancies. I doubt you will, but you may in some cases. Um, there are uh, no false positives because the two things that it cross reacts, we don't have here in Texas. So leash mania and trypanosoma rangeli, which is its cousin. Uh, we just don't have it in Texas, which is nice. Um, false negatives. Um, so, you know, the dog has the infection, but I miss it. Um, that would mean early infection. Maybe I weren't, wasn't making the antibodies yet. Um, some dogs don't make antibodies that the test detects. Um, and then there are strain type variations. We really didn't talk about the different strain types of T. cruzi, but that is definitely something that we see. There's variations in strains. And so you can have um, different antibodies produced. And if my test doesn't test for those, I'm going to miss it. Okay. And again, there's a little quote here from a paper. You know, it's, it's likely that many of the dogs that had discordant results were, um, these weren't false positives. They were actually real. So we're just basically saying, if you get a positive, you can probably bet that it really does have the disease. All right. So this is the slide. Take a picture. VRL, they run the ELISA and they also run PCR. Okay. So excellent job. I can't say enough good things with them and we're not affiliated with them at all. They just do a really good job. I'm, I'm happy about them. All right. So treatment and I'm running close on time. I'm going to kind of go a little bit faster. Um, there's a lot of things you might read about. Benzendazole has a lot of uh, pomp and circumstance on the human side. They tried it in dogs, very poor response um, in dogs in the chronic phases, especially. Um, and that there's a lot of reasons for that we won't go into. I could talk for like an hour on that, but benzodiazole is not a good option if you want to clear this parasite in dogs. Okay, allopurinol um, and some other azoles as well. The treatment that, that we've done most of our work on for the past 18 years has been a combination of two different drugs, okay, amiodarone and itraconazole. Amiodarone is an antiarrhythmic. It targets calcium channels in the heart. That's how it works. Um, but it all and it targets other channels for antiarrhythmic purposes. But on T. cruzi, it blocks calcium channels. Okay, it also blocks ergosterol, just like the second drug, which is itraconazole. Itraconazole, as you know, is an ergosterol synthesis inhibitor. Works the same way in T. cruzi as it does malassezia or you know histoplasma, any of the fungus. It works the same exact way. Okay, I put some doses up here on here, um, but let's talk about two important things: adverse events and duration of treatment. Duration of treatment is 12 months. We'll talk about that in a minute, why that is. Um, adverse events, one out of five dogs will decrease their appetite, and about one out of seven dogs will have increase in their liver enzymes. Those are things we're watching for, and the cool thing about it is all we do is we adjust the dose on either of those drugs, symptoms go away. Okay, so very, very, very mild symptoms and reversible and dose dependent. Okay. This, uh, this is a paper that we put out in 2019. We looked at 105 dogs um, that we treated. On the right, so it's a Kaplan-Meier curve. Basically, the green is treatment. The blue is, is control group or untreated. And uh, time on the right and survival on the top. So you can see the blue over two months, I'm sorry, over two years drops substantially. Uh, we had almost 40% of the dogs die. And then the green, you can see they just keep trucking. Okay. The, this drug was 100% effective if they were able to finish the protocol. Okay, so if, why wouldn't they? Well, when one of the dogs got run over by a car, one of them, they broke their leg, had to euthanize them. A couple of them got cancer. Um, we did have a couple that were euthanized because of heart failure, because they came into the study with heart failure. So, you know, it's it's 100 percent if we can make it through the treatment. So we need to the, the take home is we, we should get it going. OK, um, here's just from pharmacology. I had to throw this in there. OK, this is a ergosterol pathway. So we've got um, itraconazole blocking ergosterol with the little pink uh, molecules in two different areas. We have amiodarone flying in here like Superman. It blocks another pathway on there, okay, for all you biochem guys. Um, calcium channel blockers right here. This is T. cruzi, and it's all the pink little areas on the big diagram are calcium channels, and there are various uh, organelles uh, inside the organism. And uh, you can see amiodarone blocking the calcium. And the, this is just mechanism of action stuff, okay? So... Uh, when you combine all these things, um, including this pathway right here, which is a peptidase cruzepane that amiodarone blocks, we've got nine pathways that this drug or these drugs co combat and, and inhibit. And so um, that's super important because a lot of drugs um, only target one pathway and resistance happens in every single one of them. So when I read a paper about something, um, I'll look at it and I go, okay, well, that's nice. It's all promising. Everybody's excited. But if it only targets one pathway, it will get resistant, okay, just like we see with malaria. Okay. So to answer the question, why do we treat for 12 months? Because um, this, this pains me too, okay? I didn't, I didn't write this, okay? This is just how T. cruzi is, okay? 
Um, it loves to hide in privileged sites. The heart itself is privileged. Fat is privileged. It's everywhere. And on this electron micrograph, you can see this trypomastigo going into the livid cell. It's penetrating in there so it can hide and replicate. Drugs can't penetrate very well into these tissue sites. You have to have very special drugs that are very lipophilic, which is why these drugs, work, one of the reasons they work so well. Um, once they go into that chronic phase, they go dormant, they slow the replication rate on. Well, our drugs, as you saw, they target ergosterol, they target calcium channels. If I have a, a parasite that's not very biologically active, I'm gonna have to wait till it decides to reproduce or utilize its stores. If it's dormant, it's just gonna take me longer to kill it, okay? The other thing it does is kind of interesting. It's kind of like parvovirus. It downregulates the immune system just by being there. So T cells get downregulated um, and, and uh, it just makes it extra hard for us to eliminate the organism, okay? Um, monitoring, and I'll be real quick with this. I promise I'm getting to Dr. McBride's area. Um, what we do, this is just look at the little, the little table here, okay? Month one, after 28 days after starting treatment, we're gonna do a recheck and check some liver values, check the EKG if it was abnormal, check our itraconazole levels, we'll make adjustments as needed, and then we treat for a year. At a year, we stop treatment, we wait 30 days for the drugs to wash out, more importantly, we're waiting for that organism to reactivate if it's there and start replicating again, and then we're going to do two PCRs back to back. Now, in this table, we did it 30 days apart. That's fine. There's no set in stone, um, but there's some good evidence on the human side that you can, as long as you're taking two time points, even within the same day, like an 8 a.m. and a 5 p.m., as long as there's serial PCRs with multiple extractions, you're going to have pretty close to 100% sensitivity on finding these guys, okay? There's a great paper by Dr. Rujo out of Brazil uh, that he did back in the mid-2000s that looked at this, and they were able to find Chagas in every single dog they did, as long as they did multiple extractions with multiple samples. And that's another reason why I like VRL so well is because they pretty much replicate that in their lab. So if I get a positive on one of those, back to the drawing board, and I got to do some troubleshooting. But most of these dogs that you treat, you're going to be okay. Um, also put there, um, if you're going to measure uh, itraconazole levels, you've got a couple options. So TVMDL um, in College Station runs it. Auburn uh, used to. I don't know if they're still doing it. And then Miravista um, out on the West Coast, they do it, but they do a bioassay. So you need to make it a little adjustment, okay, because they're factoring in some of the metabolites there for, for fungus, okay. Um, supportive care, you guys can still use your typical heart meds if you need to. So, you know, vet med is still important if you have poor contraction or you have some dilation, okay? Um, obviously, Lasix and other diuretics are important. Um, I, I really like torsamide quite a bit. If you haven't used that, one of our cases we, we use that in, we'll kind of talk about that. Um, does a little bit better for ascites and edema in the intestines. So if you've got a dog with right-sided heart failure that's struggling with GI symptoms, you can actually um, treat those guys with that. I think it works a little bit better. Last slide, I promise. Um, environmental control. So we talked about treating the patient. What are we going to do in the environment? And people always ask this. Oh, God, what can I do? And this isn't very effective. Okay. I'll just throw full, dis full disclosure. Okay. All three of my own dogs in my pack have Chagas. I lost my cat to it three years ago. Okay. I do everything by the book. I follow WHO, CDC guidelines. Okay. Nothing lives in my yard except kissing bugs because my dogs find it. So spraying helps. Okay. I don't want to undermine that. Okay. But it's not, it's not a cure. Okay. So environmental control permethrins. Um, there's a particular permethrin called cypermethrin that they've done a lot of studies on in third world countries. It works really, really well to kill everything. Okay, so you're killing your scorpions and cockroaches and all that, but you're also killing these kissing bugs, which is nice. Um, we also use our systemic isoxazole. So yeah, your Perfectos, your Cordelios, some Pericatrio, all that good stuff. They're all equally effective at killing kissing bugs, okay? But the bug has to take a blood meal, right? And then it's going to get exposed and die. But it is something that you can offer your clients. It's just another reason we need to be controlling these vectors. Um, but as you know, a dead kissing bug is still just as infective as a live kissing bug. So let's say you nuke it, but it's laying there dead. Well, have your clients, you know, pick it up, scoop it up, and have them be hyper vigilant about doing that. Okay. Um, and I know this is probably going to be a question what about reinfection after treatment? Um, in reality, we don't see too many dogs get reinfected, usually because after we've been through a year of treatment, the owners are super hyper vigilant about spraying, picking up bugs. They have these dogs on these isoxazolines. And also, we've eliminated that reservoir state in the dog. Um, so now, when these kissing bugs come into the environment, they're taking blood meals on a dog that doesn't have Chagas or it's not shedding the Chagas. So they don't continue that life cycle. Okay. So it really does. Reinfection rates do happen, but they're really, really, really low. 
Okay, I'd probably say less than 5%, okay? And that is it, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, we'll have some questions uh, afterwards. All right, uh, let's see, where did it go? Well, Shannon pulls up those slides. Uh, Dr. Madigan, we had a couple of questions in the chat you might wanna just look at real quick. Okay, um, I'll read a couple out. And, oh, she's all ready to go. Do you want me to just wait till the end, Paula? Just so she can- Yeah, start. you can pop it in the chat if you if you can type that. I know you probably can type Okay, that. I'll do that. I'll do that. Thank you. All right, so these are actually uh, Dr. Madigan's cases. So if anybody has any questions or feel free to drop, drop, jump in Dr. Madigan if you have any comments that I might have missed. I'm gonna start first one out with Remy. My computer, there we go. A nine-year-old neutered lab from Texas presented the emergency clinic for diarrhea and tenesmus. Fast scan was fairly normal, except for pericardial effusion. Had an arrhythmia, and if we remember, 90% of cases tend to have arrhythmias, uh, or 90% arrhythmia is more common than, than other heart issues. Uh, had a 160 uh, beat per minute, irregular heartbeat. And then Shaga's IFA was negative and Eliza positive. So he, this is kind of a classic presentation for Shaga's disease at an emergency clinic. Here you can see his dilated heart. And then on the echo had atrial and ventricular enlargement. This is left-sided. And you can see he got the halter monitor and was PCR negative. Any other comments for him, Dr. Madigan? No, I think that's good. And it was kind of interesting too, because the dog presented to EC with uh, diarrhea and straining to defecate. Um, you know, obviously nothing to do with heart disease. <laughs> so they, this, is, this is a really good vet. I have to send them flowers. They really did a good job there um, uh, listening, doing a full exam. They really did a good job. All right. Here's just some of his echo images here and you can see the different sizes for left ventric ventricular enlargement so and then i don't know if you know if he was treated for the pulmonary hypertension i didn't see that he not was. at that time yeah we we did on the treatment sheet yeah we we did some uh, uh i think it was the silas we went with yeah i'm okay. pretty sure there's this ekg if you want to take a look at those trying to hurry through so we can get to questions. Um, as he talked about, it has the affinity for the parasympathetic, so had some bradycardia as well after the tachycardia. Oh, here we go. Here's his treatment. So he was the tadalafil instead of sodenafil. Do you have a reason? Do you have a preference for one over the other? Or I'm just lazy. Um, I like the once a day dosing. Uh, instead of three times a day dosing, <laughs> full disclosure, but you can use sildenafil. That's fine too. Whatever, or sildenafil, whatever you want to do. Yeah. Got it. And then he had his 28 day recheck. So that was him. And as far as I know, he did well, right? No, no other issues for him. And then the other case was turbo presented for a dental cleaning, 12 year old neutered lab indoor, outdoor, San Antonio, Texas. So my, pretty mild dental disease, but they were getting a prophylaxis and under anesthesia found a single uniform VPCs. So again, it can affect different parts and you can have different types of arrhythmias. Recovered fine from anesthesia and then was treated for one year. Also added in meloxicam. Can you use any NSAIDs, Dr. Madigan, or just... Yeah, you sure can. Whatever you're comfortable with. I think the only data we have are in like mice with meloxicam. So it it's whatever you want to use is fine. Got it. So then he became euthanized for actual spinal stenosis. So nothing to do with the Chagas disease, but you can see his heart here, which we saw earlier in the presentation with all that fibrosis and, and replacement of cardiac tissue with fat. And then the last one is Princeton, one of our favorites here, Frenchie, um, was presented asymptomatic wellness, 
Um, other pack mates had Chagas. And then eight weeks later, after his initial exam, he had four grand mal seizures. So did a series of vector-borne testing and, and test a whole bunch of testing and came back as positive on the IFA. And then had a collection of fluid on his MRI, which here's his MRI. And he had necrotizing encephalitis related to Chagas disease. Can you guys see that little X on there? I'm sorry to interrupt, Shannon, but does it show up on your screen? Yeah, perfect. Right there. And then over here is the little, on the other view. Um, so he was able to zero revert to negative and then lived on zonisamide long-term. After six months, he was zero reverted to negative Chagas. There you go. You want me to share screen or you need to... Oh, no, you, you keep going there. Yeah, with the registry. So this is just something um, that we're doing right now um, across Texas. Well, we've gone into other states now, but this is just Texas data right here. So 2,318 dogs that have been tested that we've been following over about 90 veterinary hospitals across Texas. Um, when we look at, we break it down to different numbers. So practices that test all dogs. So that's mostly like rescue groups and things like that. We found an almost 14% prevalence rate. Um, symptomatic dogs, you know, obviously 36% is quite a bit, quite a bit higher. So about a third of the dogs that are showing symptoms of Chagas disease are, are showing up positive, but overall 30% prevalence rate um, in these dogs out of 2,300 dogs, quite a bit. Um, but if you want to be a part of this registry and share your data, you know, negative or positive, we want to hear both. Uh, we want to put this into the computer. You can um, check out, there's uh, Maureen, she's a uh, just a huge champion for Chagas disease for us and, and really passionate about this. She's running this thing and she's doing a bang up job, but um, her email is right there. If you email her, she can enroll your clinic into that, um, into that study. And basically you, you just report, it's a real easy online questionnaire, just click and send. And we're trying to just gather data. We're trying to get a true prevalence of Chagas disease in Texas right now. Okay. And if you're out of state, just email her. I'm, I'm sure she'll, she'll be nice and let you come into the registry. Um, and then there's a there's a form. I don't even click on it through the Zoom link, but the, it's a form. It just shows you what it looks like. Maureen will be happy to send you that and, and get your practice enrolled. Um, I do recommend that uh, because Chagas disease is so prevalent that you guys have a point of contact at your at your hospital at tech that's passionate about learning new things and interested in this stuff and put them as a point of contact because you're, you're going to be busy with this. Okay. And I think our time is better dealt with the clients, um, you know, diagnosing and treating and, and following up with stuff, but you're going to have to have a tech that knows what they're doing uh, when it comes to this stuff. Okay. Uh, Roy, it's Maureen. Um, I'm happy to offer any support to any of the practices that they need. So if they need help entering dogs or, you know, whatever it is that they need, um, I'm here and um, I'm on it 100% and uh, just, uh, just reach out. I'm happy to help in any way that I can. All right, this was absolutely incredible. Thank you both. And I know, um, <laughs> you know what, we're right at 11.58 or my time, your time, it's a little bit later than that, but um, thank you all for being here. And um, I know there's still more questions, so we do have some time. I just wanna say real quick before we do launch into that, um, please fill out the evaluation, especially if you're gonna do CMEs or um, CEUs. We have to have your evaluation on file in order to issue those. They'll come out in about three weeks or less, uh, and they'll be coming from South Coastal AHEC, who has been supporting us with this. So questions. I know we've been trying to answer them in the chat, but maybe let's just start. And if any of you need to sign off, please go ahead. And those of you who want to stick around, um, we're here. Hey, Paula, I want to, can I read this one from Eileen? This is a really good question. We get this a lot. Um, so Eileen asks, if a, if a dog is testing positive for Chagas, how do you know that that's what's causing the disease and it's not just bad genetics? Like, let's take, for instance, the Doberman pincher, okay? So <clears throat> how do we know that it's dilated cardiomyopathy because of Chagas or because of genetics, okay? So we do have some genetic testing available. Um, and I think, please don't kill me if I'm wrong, I think it's out of North Carolina, uh, but they do have some markers um, for dilated cardiomyopathy in boxers and in dobies. So that's one way you could go. So genetic testing. Um, but even beyond that, um, you know, get your echo done, uh, do your Holter monitor, um, with, you know, with your cardiologist, or if you're doing it, you can even do an EKG five minute strip is great. Okay. I don't want to 
to, to poo poo that. Okay. I think it's a good diagnostic and then start treatment. Okay. Um, I still would put them on Pima Benden, um, because again, it's going to help a Chagas dog, but it's also going to help a dog with dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. So do it appropriate for whatever stage of disease they're in. Okay. Um, if he needs a diuretic, go ahead and do that. I love spironolactone. I'm going to throw that at him too. Okay. Um, go ahead and do those normal things that you do, but add in the amiodarone and intraconazole. Okay. Um, the other thing that I, and so let me stop there. If the dog gets better, um, and it will with Chagas disease, okay, meaning the function is going to get better, the chamber size is going to go down, um, then you know that it was probably that. And then, and we do this a lot. We, you know, we, we re-echo, we re-radiograph. And then if we're seeing those changes, and like Remy, for instance, uh, he just came in not too long ago. I just had my 28-day recheck with him. I re-echoed him, and his function is normal now. So guess who, who gets to start getting weaned off of vet med and slowly, right? So you can start weaning your meds down. It's not going to be a chronic lifelong thing, most likely. Now, if you do the Chagas and the disease progresses and you've done everything right, well, you know there's probably a big genetic component to that. Okay, so hopefully that answers your, your question there. And the same goes for diet-related cardiomyopathies. I mean, we don't have a test for that, right? It's just like this catch-all term. Well, it's nothing else. It must be the diet. Well, you know, I'm not going to get in my soapbox, I promise. Maureen, I wouldn't do this about this diet thing. But um, you got to be checking those guys for Chagas, and they typically aren't. Okay, so once you take that off the board, um, you're, you're fine. You can focus in on that diet-related cardiomyopathy. Or what's the harm in just switching them, adding in some grains, you know, put them on a regular diet and do the Chagas treatment. You know, we may never know which one it was, but who cares? The dog got better, right? Um, and the same goes for things outside the heart, like megasophagus. If I have a megasophagus case come in, I'm I'm definitely checking for Chagas. Yeah, I'm checking for Addison's too and hypothyroid, myasthenia gravis, but I'm definitely putting that on my list because I've had dogs with Chagas and megasophagus. And um, and I think that needs to be on our list so we can hopefully treat them. Okay. We have a couple of questions in the in the chat. Okay, I'll, I'll start at the most recent. Um, so yeah, we're we're working. So right now we're working on getting the intraconazole uh, combined. Um, it's actually already been done, but <laughs> FDA takes a while. But those two drugs, um, the cool thing about it is we put it in a quad tab. Okay, so it's real easy to, to quarter, and um, that's going to be good for like our chihuahuas. Okay, and that's going to one quarter of a tablet will be equivalent to twelve point five milligrams of intraconazole. Um, and so you're going to be able to really dose these small guys, or if they're really sensitive to intraconazole, you'll be able to go way down. You know, currently we're having to use the human preps, right? So we've got a hundred milligram intraconazole. And just as a side note on dosing small dogs and cats for that matter, you can open up these capsules and sprinkle them on there. They still absorb the drug, which is awesome. Um, you can also go, let's say, well, instead of doing a half a capsule once a day, um, I could do a one capsule every other day because the half-life is so long. So you can kind of play with that. Some dogs can't, can't tolerate that hit though. That C-max goes way through the roof on the day that you give it, even at steady state. So you may, you may push the envelope on that on side effects. So you can play around with that. What I don't recommend is do not do compounding. Itraconazole is a very poorly soluble drug and it does not go into solution. It does not get absorbed very well at all unless they process it after production. Okay. So those capsules, those cute little granules, they're not granules because they're cute. Okay. They're granules because they had to spray dry that to increase surface area so it can even be absorbed. So do not mess with that. We have a paper coming out um, second quarter of 2024 in uh, therapeutics and pharmacology, where we looked at compounded amiodarone, itraconazole, we kind of compared them in dogs to see what was happening. And it was it's very, very discouraging to see what's happening on compounding. So even though they might tell you, hey, yeah, I can compound that, no problem. It's just it's just not going to be worth it, okay? But a safety check is you're checking that intraconazole level at 28 days. So you're going to know if you're if you're getting the levels um, that you need, okay? Um, so we talked about prevalence. Um, I'm really excited to see what Paul and Shannon, can, Shannon come up with, with prevalence in California. They're working on some good stuff right now uh, in San Diego. So hopefully we'll have some good data on California soon, uh, if any of you guys are from there. Um, so this is another really good question we get. Carrie had this question. So um, if my dog doesn't have an arrhythmia, he's shagas positive, he doesn't have an arrhythmia, do I just do itraconazole? 
And the answer is no, because amiodarone, remember from, from the, the, the pictures, the graphics, it, it actually kills the organism. Yes, it is an antiarrhythmic. Yes, it controls most of the arrhythmias associated with Chagas and prevents against those excitatory induced arrhythmias. But the big thing is it's going to kill the organism, okay? And they've looked at itraconazole alone, amiodarone alone, um, and a paper just came out this week uh, looking at amiodarone and dronetarone. It doesn't work well um, alone. But when we combine them, that's where, that's where the magic happens with that synergy, okay? You have to have both of them, okay? So I put them on both. Um, and as veterinarians, obviously, we're trained on, you know, tell us as a vet school, oh, you don't want to induce arrhythmia by putting them on an antiarrhythmic. Totally agree. We don't want to induce an arrhythmia, but we've treated well over a thousand dogs and we've never induced an arrhythmia that we've been able to detect. Okay. Obviously, they're not wearing holters 24 7. Okay. But we've never seen that before. I've heard it from one cardiologist that she induced one. Um, but again, that's that's one out of over well over a thousand. So this, this drug is super, super, super safe. In fact, amiodarone is on the WHO essentials list. Okay, so like, like I must have this to practice and live. It, it's really, really uh, well used in human medicine. For some reason, we went to choose sodalol as veterinarians. Okay, uh, believe it or not, sodalol actually causes more bradycardia than amiodarone does. Okay, as far as side effect profile. So um, I, I'm a big advocate. Once you start using it, you'll feel very comfortable with it. Um, I personally will script out uh, my itraconazole. I don't carry it in house because it's a pretty expensive drug. Um, so I have most of my uh, patients, you know, Walmart, you can ask for the good RX price and they can get it for about $1.25 a capsule. So that's $1.25 for 100 milligrams. Um, Amiodarone is dirt cheap. Okay. They come in 200s and 100s. So you can kind of play around with that dose if you want to. Um, but most, most places have that. I do carry amiodarone in the, in the hospital. Because if I have a dog that comes in with an arrhythmia, Chagas or not, um, that's my go-to, okay? I mean, obviously, I'll do lidocaine, IV, just like everybody else. But as far as orals, there's nothing like amiodarone as far as, you know, melting down arrhythmias. They really do a good job. Can I ask a question out loud instead of on the chat? Oh, I would love that, please. <laughs> okay, awesome. Hi, Dr. Madigan. I'm Dr. Serafi, and I've emailed you multiple times. Yeah, hey, too many. how are you? Hey, <laughs> doing okay. Um, I had a question about um, treating the emergency dog for tachycardia. I actually had two within the same day. Um, the first one did not respond to my lidocaine boluses and wound up passing. Um, the second one managed to, you know, convert her and, and get her back, and she's bouncing off the kennels today, but... Didn't know if there was any other recommendations on the emergency treatment for tachycardia. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, the very first dog I had ever had that I knew that had Chagas disease, um, I couldn't get his arrhythmia under control either, and he died. Um, so, what? Just curious, was it a young dog, less than a year? Um, the first one, yes. The second one, no. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, usually the young dogs, they have a very inappropriate immune response and, and they can kill themselves basically. Um, so what I usually will do is I'll, I'll do just what you did. Okay. I mean, awesome. Um, but when I don't get that effect, uh, within a few minutes of the lidocaine and I give another dose and I still don't get the effect. Um, and, and, you know, if the cardiologist might choose something different, but I'm going to give a dose of oral amiodarone. Okay. It works really, really fast. It's the same thing I do, you know, in dogs with heart failure, I'm going to give them a dose of oral pemovendin mainly because I don't have IV pemovendin. Um, they have injectable amiodarone, um, but like yeah. I don't carry it, um, but you could go that route too. Um, but I would get that on board ASAP. Um, in the, the dogs in the study that we, we did that paper on, um, within two hours, they had they had CMAX. Okay, so it's like, I mean, two hours. I'm pretty sure you have maybe two hours at least. So, you know, get that on board ASAP and, and see if you can um, get that going. And of course, you know, if... Again, if it's just tachycardia and we don't truly have like VTAC or anything like that, you can, um, you know, you, you may be able to add in some of these other drugs like the Pemobendin, okay, to help out with that um, also. Awesome. Thank you so much. Dr. Madigan, we have a question about adding insects to asymptomatic dogs. Yeah, that that's a that's a good question. I don't typically, personally, I don't add in NSAIDs unless the dog's feeling bad, okay? Or I have, you know, that dilated heart, um, or I have uh, functional issues, okay? So basically, in my thought process, I'm like, does this dog have enough inflammation 
that it's showing up as decreased function or dilation. Okay. If I don't, I'm probably not going to do it. But there are some dogs that are just super mopey uh, with this. I mean, myocarditis, I've never had it, thank God, but I mean, it can't feel good. So um, I, I would want to make them feel better. Okay. And obviously, you know, do your say your typical checklist, you know, is my kidney function okay? You know, am I dehydrated? Am I going to increase this dog dog's risk for gastric ulcers? You know, I mean, do your normal check down. But if it's if you're good there, I mean, give some. I mean, if, let's relieve a little bit of discomfort and pain. I'm all, I'm all for it. And again, if you twisted my arm and said, well, which one would you use? I, I'd, I'd use any of them, but Meloxicam, I really love Meloxicam. I think it's super safe. So I would be more inclined to, to do that. And plus the studies were done in rats with that. So I, I might I might kind of stick to that. We have another question about vaccines. Have you had any thoughts, research, anything on the vaccines for dogs? Does that come up? Yeah, yeah. So when we can talk about that for a minute, you know, preventative, you know, how, what, what are we doing for prevention? Okay, so um, we helped out uh, UT Tropical Medical School in Houston about God, it's probably been at least 10 years, if not 12 years ago. Um, to help them try to help them with the vaccine to help prevent it. And so they filed a patent on it. Um, they did have some success with it, meaning they reduced disease um, per presentation, still infected everybody, of course. But they used, um, if you think back to that slide with like cross reactivity, that trypanosoma wrangeli or T wrangeli, the cousin to Chagas, it doesn't do anything. It's just it's non pathogenic. We, they, they took T wrangeli. I guess they attenuated it and then, you know, injected the dogs with it. They did get some cross reactivity with that. OK, so those dogs, when they challenged them, about half of them um, had a decrease in symptoms. OK, compared to the control group. So I think there was some good out of that. Um, the downside, though, is, you know, hello, my my test will now be positive. Forever. <laughs> so um, that opens up a whole other can of worms. And I don't know if some of you guys have practiced long enough, but, you know, we used to have that FIV vaccine for cats and it would automatically turn their test positive for the rest of their life. Um, you know, that was kind of challenging, right? You had to put on their record. He's had FIV, but you know, he's, he's had the vaccine. Don't kill the cat because he has FIV. Um, so it, it, it kind of, eh. and then USDA would never approve a vaccine that only worked 50% of the time. You know, they have very, and, and even the parasitic guys at FDA, I mean, you got to really show efficacy, um, you know, 90%, 80, 90%. Um, you know, obviously with rabies, hundred percent on challenge. So I don't, I don't know. I don't think we're anywhere close to getting a vaccine for this. Okay. But that being said, uh, we are working on, on a preventative right now, um, that is similar to ProHeart. Okay. So a slow release of drugs to help prevent it at a lower dose. Okay. So if we can get a low enough dose and not have side effects, um, you know, long-term, cause you got to figure out, okay, if we'll, if my dog lives 16 to 18 years, hopefully forever, but, you know, 16 to 18 years, can I give this safely over that time course and not you know, have chronic changes in the liver or the lungs? So we're playing around with that right now. And I, I totally agree. I think we need to really look into prevention. and we, we really need to in a big way. Great. And one more question about uh, confirmation. So if there is a positive on a lateral flow, would you recommend confirming it? And if so, how would you recommend that? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, well, with the lateral flow test right now that, you know, some of you guys are using, um, I, I'll just tell you what I do. Okay. So I get my 20 kits. I get, you want to know how many how positives I had, but we had quite a few positives. Um, I sent every one of them off for confirmatory ELISA. Okay. And a hundred percent agreement. Okay. With that. And, and we would expect that, right. Cause um, again, there's, I don't want to say there's never, but it's very rare that you'll get a false positive there. Okay. What I worry about personally um, are false negatives. And, um, you know, again, a little soapbox on my part, you know, confirmatory testing. Um, and again, I won't tiptoe on, on human side, but for me, um, I'm more worried about, and WHO and PAHO are all more worried about you missing as a doctor, missing a diagnosis of Chagas disease because the consequences are severe. Okay. So if I miss a dog with Chagas, I miss a person with Chagas because my test because it's not perfect, then what have I done to that person or dog? Um, well, he's going to progress with his disease. We know that. Now, whether it's going to be clinical or not, or I don't know. But with a mortality rate up to 42%, I don't want to roll the dice. And I wouldn't do that with my kids. I wouldn't do that with my dogs, okay, or my cat, which died from it, right? So um, if I get a positive, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start treatment on that dog, okay? I'm comfortable with that. And that's it. Okay. But if you're worried, you're skeptical, whatever, start treatment on the dog and recheck. Give it 60 days. You're not going to hurt the dog on drugs. Recheck them in 60 days and then see what you get. Okay. 
or go ahead and do your confirmatory test with your ELISA. Then you've got a lateral flow in ELISA. There's a great technology, but you know, in my mind, just logically doesn't make sense. Why would I want to do an IFA as a tiebreaker? So I got a positive. I'm going to let my IFA that has a 70% sensitivity decide if my test is any good. It makes zero sense to me. Okay. So, because I'm going to call that negative and you know, I mean, they, they have their reasons for doing it on the human side, but I just, I totally disagree with the animals. And I think we need to really trust our test. Okay. And if I'm, if I'm hanging my hat on, well, you know, if he has symptoms, then I'll believe it. Ah, it's too late at that point. You know, you already have symptoms. You're, you know, a lot of these dogs are, are going to have disease, but not have those changes you're looking for. Now, if you're doing a, you know, cardiac MRI, echo, and Fulter on every dog that has Chagas, which you aren't, and I'm not either, then maybe you could kind of say, okay, maybe I'll watch this dog. But, you know, if, if you look hard enough, you will find something, I promise. And you, if you give it enough time, you'll find it too, okay? So that's my long answer to say, if you want to do a confirmatory grade, just make sure you use a test that has close to the same sensitivity, okay? And I, uh, just as a side note, I had um, the ELISA cutoff. Um, it changes, right, for every batch that they do every couple months. But like, but today it's 0 0.314. Okay. That anything below that's negative, anything above that's positive. I've had two dogs in the past couple of weeks that were 0 0.313. They were one one thousandth away from being positive. So do I think that that test is that good, that that dog is truly negative? And by the way, these dogs have arrhythmias. Okay. Do I really believe that test? The answer is no. So I'm going to, I'm going to put that dog on drugs and I'm going to come back in 60 days and I'm going to recheck those guys. Okay. And I've had this happen before and a hundred percent of the time so far they've come, they've, they've popped positive at that point. Okay. We just need a little bit more antibody to break that threshold. Okay. So if you do enough of these tests, you may find yourself in that situation, but don't be afraid to retest and tell the owners that I need to retest to make sure, or hey, I'm going to put you on drugs just so your dog doesn't drop dead. And then we're going to recheck. Okay. And if he's negative, great. You know, and some dogs do zero revert, like zero revert. They will clear on their own. I've had it happen twice, but that's in 18 years. Two dogs, they were in the acute phase. They were both Belgian Malinois. If anybody's worked with Belgian Malinois, you know that they're not really dogs. They're androids, right? They're superhuman dogs. So it doesn't surprise me that they would self-clear, right? But those dogs did zero out within 60 days. Okay. So again, if you're worried that you well, what if he, what if this is a false positive? What if he's going to clear on his own? We'll just recheck it. Okay. I think that's fair. All right. So hopefully that helps. Great. Thank you, Dr. Madigan. I know we're way over time. I just have one final question for you. Um, you know, I care about both the animal and the human side. How do you communicate with your clients when they get those positives about the potential for them to need to test their families and themselves as well? And also, have you been tested lately? I just no, after now I know about your household. I'm now I'm worried about you. <laughs> Just curious. <laughs> she, she's throwing me on. She's pulling me out on the carpet here. Um, so yes, I, you'll be proud of me. So we every single client um, that is attached to a dog that, or a cat that has Chagas disease, we have the same conversation. So I'm not trying to scare you, Miss Jones, but you and your household need to get tested, okay? And then here's what I say too, Paula, because this is important. Go to your your family practitioner and say, my dog has Chagas, I need to be tested. And I say, don't say anything other than that phrase over and over again. Because what usually happens is they're like, huh, what's that? We don't test for that. I don't know what to, and you just keep saying that. And eventually they'll look up the code. And I said, and if you need the code, I have the code. And I said, you can even go to Walmart and get your blood drawn at Quest. And then they'll have the code and they'll send it. And the doctor can order it. So we definitely do that. Um, I, I Everybody at the clinic got tested back in April. Um, and we were all negative. OK, thank God, uh, including my household, my kids, they really love getting stuck by me. That was fun. Um, so that was yes. So I, I practice what I preach. We do tell our clients that. OK, so again, put it in context. OK, so we've been doing this almost 20 years. OK, I've had well up until like two months ago, I had four families test positive. OK, so husband, wife and then two other separate families. They were all over Texas. So it wasn't just our area. Okay. These were actually closer to Houston. Um, two of the families were. So uh, they got tested and I like to think, Hey, that's good. They wouldn't have normally gotten tested for Shaga. So good job on their dogs for saving their life. Right. I don't know what happened. I didn't follow up with them on their, their part of it. But um, if y'all have a second, I'll tell you a cool, cool little story here in a minute. Um, we just had a 72 year old woman um, two weeks ago, uh, go to the hospital because of Chagas and their 
Um, there, I think family member is one of my patients that has a GSP Meshuggah's disease. Okay. So that's kind of cool. That's pretty recent and it's a clinical person. Okay. I think they live between here and Austin, so somewhere North of us. Um, and then we had uh, a gentleman pass away that was 26 years old, um, that has a big dilated heart and they're still, you know, they're still doing some work and that was close to Houston. Okay. And his dog has Shuggah's disease. And in fact, that's, that's Remy's owner. Uh, well, was Remy's owner. Okay. So we definitely see it. And that's one way we could directly work with physicians. Okay. Cause they call and they're like, uh, they want to pull the trigger and go with viral myocarditis. Maybe it is. I don't know, but his dog has Chagas. He's higher risk. They need to check for that, but they don't know how. Okay. So as veterinarians, you might be on the front line. You will be on the front line with helping people uh, get a diagnosis. Okay. And the last, the, the cool story is um, this is about 10 years ago. I had a guy, a vet from Corpus Christi. So South Texas on the coast, call me and um, said, yeah, he's this, this older couple. Well, she's a widow. Um, dog has Chagas. We went through all this and I said, Hey, don't forget. I know she's an older lady, but have her get tested and everything. He calls me back the next week and goes, you know, her husband just died about six months ago from, from cardiac arrest. He was like 82. That woman had him exhumed. They dug him up and had him tested and he tested positive for Chagas disease. Okay. I will never forget that story as long as I live. Okay. Um, it, it, heart disease is super common in people. It's the number one killer in America, right? So they're just like, yeah, it's coronary heart disease. We're not even going to look. So, you know, for your loved ones, you might want to encourage them when they have heart disease that, you know, you may want to get tested. Okay. And, and you don't have to be a hunter or go outside or live in a tent. Okay. Or, or live in the palm trees like in Venezuela, which are the high risk folks, right? You can just be a normal average person that lives in Texas. Okay. We're in the South and get exposed. So definitely have that conversation with your folks and uh, your clients and, They'll appreciate it for sure. Thanks so much. I know we've been kind of working with our task force on having a letter that's sort of a, you know, like a, a template for, for the veterinarians to be able to share with their families, just like they do with the blood donations. Somebody tests positive by donating blood. The Red Cross sends them a letter, says, go talk to your primary care provider. Here's the information. They're doing that in Texas right now, and that's great. So maybe something like that we can talk about providing for people. Hey, here's a template. You know, you can give this to your to your clients and then they can talk with their doctors. And I know um, thanks to Dr. Matt again and, and everyone else, we've been working real hard on raising awareness with physicians, human physicians um, and veterinarians seem to have a lot more information about Chagas disease than the human doctors. So, you know, I really applaud that for keeping up with the checking the dogs and they really are sort of that push to get in this one health world to get this disease on the radar for everyone. So thank you again for your time. This was fantastic. Um, and thank you all for sticking around for so long. I think um, you have a lot of fans out there that are interested in what you're doing and how you're doing it. So, and thank you, Dr. McBride also for jumping in and also for just all that you're doing out here in California to help raise awareness with us here as well. Uh, with that, I would love to say that um, we are glad that you're here. We'll post the slides and the um, the session up on our website, which I put in the chat. So stay tuned. And if you do have any questions, uh, you'll have Dr. Madigan, Dr. McBride. You have my contact information. Uh, Maureen is also the, there to help with the registry. So please let us know if you need anything at all. And thank you again to both of you for, for your time today and to our team for helping organize this session.